we don't want to raise the cost at all. So if you think of a circuit board that has three mil tracing space technology, that's the cost. You can go down to one mil tracing space, it'll still be kind of costed at uh, the three mil tracing space technology. And the benefit is short, like, shrinking at the design, less layer counts, you know, whatever you want. It is really yeah. But it won't be a, like a crazy all right, thank you, Amit. Um, go check out Sierra's website. They got a lot of different uh, videos and stuff on there. It's a pretty neat <laughs> experience there. So. Thank you. Now we're going to turn it over to Ben. He's the director of community tools and content of Altium. Is that still correct? I won't go into his whole big pile. He's a computer systems and PCB engineer with over 20 years of experience in embedded systems, FPGA, and PCB design. And it's up to you, Don. Thank okay. you. Um, well, thanks for having me, Bob. Oh, baby. I can't even see it. Uh, that was a great presentation, I mean, I am mildly intimidated, even though I've done this before. Um, so apparently this is Sponsor Spotlight, so I guess what I could do is probably give you guys a quick preview of what's coming up soon um, in Altium Designer 19, which is our flagship CAD tool. Um, let me switch over here. Letting me do that. Wait one second. All right. So, unfortunately, going through, they, they didn't really think of signal integrity when they planned the room. So, you know, the colours are a bit strange on this screen, but we'll we'll deal with it. Um, so, many of you are already using or have used Altium Designer in the past. Uh, in, in case you're not familiar with it, it's probably one of the three main or most popular packages for a PCB and schematic design in North America at least. And I've been with Altium for 14 years and had done a lot of stuff um, early on with FPGA design, but really our strength is PCB. So my career is sort of taken a roundabout way to get to PCB design. And um, as many of you probably have heard, our one of our unique claims to fame which is I guess the others are catching up slowly is the ability to model the board and assembly in 3D it's definitely a, a big strength uh, but there's a lot of other things Altium Designer is very focused on the whole process of engineering a board level electronics product so uh, so there's a lot of capabilities for component management library management you can see I've got some Analog Designs, this is one of my hobby projects that I work on. And uh, there's a lot in the schematic for, for managing the overall design process as well. Um, so for example, something new that's coming in AD19, I'm currently in the Beta 5, it should be released in December. Uh, we have a really neat um, part search capability. Hopefully you can all see that okay. Now it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what uh, the component is, it could, could be something that's already in a design, maybe I've imported this and I have no other component information other than perhaps the symbol and its footprint, or maybe I have a very detailed library where my component has links to the data sheet, links to DigiKey, Mauser, whoever I purchased from, all of that can be done. Uh, it, but it doesn't matter either way, I can just search for a component here. So let's say I want to find a dual low noise op amp. And it gives really fast response. It gives me a whole bunch of different uh, possibilities. That you'll see some of these have a green marker, some have an orange or red. And these are all supply chain indicators. So we've actually got a built-in link through our Optipart database and search engine. Has anyone heard of Optipart, by the way? Mm -hmm. Opti a few of you use Optipart. So it's, it's an online search engine for finding parts in the supply chain. And now, 
with that, we're also populating the whole Octopart database and search engine with symbols and footprints. Currently, obviously, because we're Altium, we support Altium symbols and footprints um, for all of our products, but also for, uh, for Eagle, and we're working on ORCAD and others as well, because we want this to be useful for everybody, regardless of what tool you're using. But built into the Altium Designer user interface, we have this component search capability, and it's showing me these are ranked on top because they meet my search criteria best, and they're available in the supply chain currently, there's stock. I can get, actually buy them. Can you so. filter by footprint, by package, yep. things I like could that? search by any of those categories, like and there's a filter up here. I can limit to different manufacturers. Let's say I prefer uh, TI over, say, uh, Intersil or ON. I can say only search TI parts or <coughs> only search parts that are supplied in tape and reel, surface mount or through hole or specific footprint packages, or JEDEX packages, like SOP. It's similar um, to a DigiKey search. Basically, it's got the same taxonomy, but it's all built into the tool. And from here, I can download or acquire the, the, the models for actually using it in my design. So I acquire puts it in my library, and I can then use it. Uh, many of you, being careful, fastidious PCB designers, would probably do another step and modify it to make sure it meets your, your own individual specs. That's fine, but you can do that. Uh, or I could, if, if I trust the models in the Octopart database, I can place them straight into my design. Um, so that's just something new coming that just makes it easier. To, it's, it's kind of like a central cloud library that everybody has access to. Um, and for those of you, some of you may be particularly Cadence users are probably using a tool called Ultra Librarian. Who's heard of Ultra Librarian? And that's um, that that was acquired, I think, last year or the year before by EMA, the resellers for Cadence tools. They also draw their data from the same database, from our Octopart database. So, it's um, th the symbols and footprints are, are different, but the actual component data and supply chain information is the same. Just just a bit of information out there for you guys who are using Ultra Librarian. Um, so what else is new? Then we have, instead of a library panel in <coughs> version 19, we've gone away from that and we just call it components. Because like many mature EDA tools, there's more than one way to skin the cat of library management. And so you may have discrete symbol and footprint libraries in Altium Designer. You may attach them into your actual project. You can see I've got a project here with its own library folder. That's just how I manage the libraries for my hobby designs that I work on uh, on, on the side while I'm not doing marketing for Altium. Uh, but a lot of people do this. And another, the alternative is you can have a unified library or you can have a database-driven library where you're connecting to your corporate PLM system and it's all centralized and you have a librarian and a more formal process. Uh, and many people are using a database that we provide for that called Vault, um, which is, is recently been renamed another product name. I won't go into that because I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, but Needless to say, there's many different ways of doing things and it really just depends on your company's needs and requirements and who your customers are as to what they require. So if you need a more formalized flow, you can do that. But either way, it doesn't matter what library management uh, method you're using, um, all of it goes through this one common interface that's easy to use that has that same search capability. Um, so if, if I want to find a part like um, LM4562. Did I type in the wrong thing? It should be in this design here. And of course, the same filterings in here. Uh, well, if it doesn't find the result, it says you can try part search. It's found more than 22 in the generic part search, which I was in before. Or I can create a new component, and then we have. Uh, a simple UI for building everything you need, the symbol and the footprint. Uh, what else is coming new in Altium Designer 19 that I can show you? Uh, 
Uh, or does anyone have any questions? Because there are some, the cadence you is. Are you on Mac? No, I'm, I'm running in Windows, I dual boot. So Altium Designer is still native Windows. Yeah. But over time it will become cross platform. It's not Yeah, yeah. It's not here. No, no, it takes. Because we have, so, our software development started in in 1985, on on Pascal, and then Delphi, and then we have to refactor everything to a portable language, and it's it's a multi-year project. But that is that is on our roadmap to have proper cross platform. Eighty-five, you have you have a uh, for the Mac. There Google was. Is available for the Mac. That's what, there was, and nobody yeah. purchased it. We sold one license. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Only one license. <laughs> no, I never <laughs> <laughs> but, but I got the uh, floppy disk. Or, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, okay. So, something else that we've done more recently is multi-board design capabilities. And I guess that's what I want to talk about today, but I don't want to just demo our software and do a huge product pitch. I know, I know pretty much all the big EDA tools support multi-board design in some way. Maybe not all in the same ways. Uh, but first, before I get into all that and show you some slides and show you a demo, um, I wanted to ask everyone here uh, who, first of all, who, who does design systems where there's more than one PCB? Pretty much everyone, if not three quarters, pr pretty much everyone. It's kind of unavoidable, right? But what are the main problems that you've had as a designer in the past dealing with multi-board systems? Any, any, anyone willing to share? Carl? Well, there's... Fit like not matching if somebody moves the mounting hole on one board and you forget to move it on the other one. Yep, if somebody swaps the pinouts on a connector on one board and you forget on the other board, mm -hmm. um, yep. that's pretty common for people to switch stuff around and then not communicate about it. Um, that's a really those are two things that will really irritate a manager of the group, yeah, afterwards. <laughs> between the two yeah. boards, if you had a dollar board with parts on both sides. Yeah. Colliding parts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you imagine what it must have been like in the 50s doing cordwood construction with through axial parts going between boards too? Like, can you imagine the nightmare planning that? I've done uh, boards like that. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's not easy, right? Yeah, Even just from a very practical, yeah, very practical standpoint, and the main problems are the mechanical side. So I, I guess as a, as a EDA vendor, we decided that should be what we focus on fixing first. But there is a whole lot of other things about multi-board design that it's good to discuss and be aware of. Um, and so, so I just want to launch into some of that uh, and just share some of my thoughts. And you probably have more experience, a lot more experience than I do. Uh, but hopefully this, this is useful and helpful um, to, to think about planning. So what I wanted to do is start with, um, let's start here. Is this, this is the most important question. Why, why are you doing multi-board design? Because most of us don't really think about it. It just happens. You do, in my case, uh, and one of the examples I'll show you. I, I designed my own guitar pedals, stomp boxes. If any of you are musicians, you'll know what I'm talking about. And I have more than one PCB inside one little metal box. One is for the main circuit that does the tone shaping or effects, and, and then there might be another one for the jacks and the connectors, and there might be another one for the foot switch. Um, I even use a PCB as a front panel because it's an expedient way of doing a nice looking screen printed front panel for a device like that. And in, in all of those cases, like I'm doing it because it's convenient and easy, but I, it's going to make it easier for me to assemble my final product. But there's different reasons why. I mean, 
In other cases, you're doing multi-board because you're making a system that's modular and conforms to some kind of standard. So you might be doing a server motherboard. In server motherboards, you're going to have, uh, it's inherently a multi-board system because you have memory modules, you have the CPU module, you have riser cards, all sorts of other things plugging in. In that case, you're a little more constrained, right? Because you're following some standards set forth by JEDEC, if it's DDR, memory interfaces, um, PCI SIG, if it's PCIe slots, and things like that. Um, so it's important to say, why are we doing this at the beginning? Because it helps you with your planning and your partitioning of the design. You know, a lot of people think of partitioning in a multi-board system, you think of taking one big thing that's big and complex and you want to divide and conquer, right? So you're going to basically separate things out. And if you know why you're doing multi-board, that separation is way more intelligent. You might say, we want to do it to get this job done faster and better. So we'll give the power supply section to a power electronics expert and we'll give the high-speed digital section to someone who's good at high-speed digital and knows impedance controlled routing and can set up the constraints and do all of that. So it, it all seems obvious, but a lot of us, I find, uh, in my, my research at least, we don't necessarily ask this question at the beginning of the job. And therefore, you can run into trouble later on when it comes time to integrate the whole system together. You can end up with connectors that have far too many pins, more than would be needed. Uh, then that leads to signal integrity problems and you know a whole lot of cascading effects occur so definitely um, know why you're doing this the most obvious thing that we all think of is form and fit and hence that's where the problems come in with z-axis clearance um, interconnection pin swapping all of this drops from here and I already mentioned the divide and conquer methodology and, the, and one that we think of perhaps a bit less, but it is a reason to do this, uh, is obfuscation. A good example of this is power supplies, where you have... I don't, I, I don't know about you, but I've noticed that a lot of um, high-end medical power supplies have potted parts that are on separate PC PCBs, because they're hiding something, and they're also protecting it and providing an extra layer of isolation. So there's all these different reasons and those reasons lead to how you do your partitioning. Um, so <coughs> modularity is another one, and design reuse. And of course, even down at the hobby level, this is a design done in our free circuit maker tool, which is like a cut down version of Altium Designer for open source. Even at that level, people are doing multi-board systems. Um, although that tool doesn't provide the modeling like Altium Designer does, but it's just to show like everyone does this whether you really think about it too much or not. So just because of time I'm not going to go through this whole whole deck which was um, originally developed for uh, a two hour training session but I'll just I'll just give you the quick once over of the petitioning methods that I've seen. This one I call dumb cut which is where you basically just have to shoehorn a big assembly into a small enclosure. And so it's effectively saying, we just have to divide this thing down the middle and fold it over or uh, find some way of interconnecting everything so it fits in the, in the final uh, form. And that can lead to all sorts of issues. A good example of that is these cheap phone chargers the knockoff of the iPhone chargers. Has anyone else done a teardown on one of these things? These are little flyback DC to DC converters that charge your phone. What do you notice about this? Carl, you do, you do power electronics. You can probably instantly see a number of problems with this design. Well, it's single-sided, so there is no reference plane. That's one thing for sure. Yep. Uh, there's... Uh, you're probably not meaning your impedance rules for that USB signal, I'm guessing. <laughs> no, probably not. <coughs> it's all axial needed. Yeah. Surface mount. Yep. We can't see any surface mount. 
And in fact, in this case, there was no surface oh, mount yeah, part. Yeah, it's just through hole. This this is uh, this is your switching device that is uh, the primary side of a flyback converter that's supposed to be safety isolated because you can touch the USB cable that plugs in here. And the other side of this goes into the wall outlet. Hmm. So maybe not enough isolation, but there's an insidious problem with this too. Uh, for it, 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 Who's designed a flyback regulator before? Or done a PCB for a flyback, a few of you? You know what happens is you charge up this inductor and then you let it go and the secondary winding of the inductor discharges the magnetic field through your rectifier diode and into your bulk storage cap for the power supply. And they're here and the inductor's here and you've got this ribbon cable between them. So now we've created this horrible spiky current loop going from the secondary all the way through here and back. And wrapped it around your USB. And wrapped it around a USB connector. Yeah. So, so like this may work, it may, uh, it may charge your phone successfully, but there's no way in heck this thing ever passed any FCC regulations. Absolutely not. And so you have to be careful with things like partitioning to consider the radiation and EMI and signal integrity side of it. I'm just highlighting this as a really particularly bad example just to, to bring some awareness of that. So there's the secondary uh, filter cap and here's your, your rectifying um, a trapezoidal current waveform through that connector. There's your diode current on, a, on the secondary of a flyback converter. So it's just pretty bad. Um, so the other way of doing partitioning is for functional blocks. Uh, but really, this all comes down to planning. Everything's important. You've got to just divide up the system with your electrical awareness. You have to think about interfaces, their mechanical connections, edge connections. Sorry, this slide's a little messy. It was thrown together uh, probably too quickly. What technologies you're going to use. Another reason for doing multi-board partitioning sometimes is that a big chunk of, this, of the product may require only two layers circuit boards and you can save some money by doing your power supply separately because it's only going to be a two layer board or even single layer as that pre previous example was and then the main board might be eight layers so you can save money so all of this planning comes up uh, into into the front of this process um, so Often in multi-board design, you're dealing with multiple people, and so communication is really critical and paramount. You want to be able to have multiple different PCB design projects, maybe spread amongst the team, but still be able to bring those together at the end and have that collaboration between you, and, uh, and to be able to communicate problems like this Z-axis or Z-axis fit problem that, uh, that you mentioned. And the other side is the electrical interfaces. This is an example. Um, one of our FAEs, Chris Carlson, used to do power electronics, and he did multi-board assemblies uh, without all these tools. This is a snippet of a spreadsheet he used to use to manage the interconnects on different interfaces between the boards. And every time there was a, an ECO, he had to up manually update this spreadsheet and make sure and double, triple check to make sure it was all accurate. Um, so we want to solve those sorts of problems and make that process way more automatic. And so that's what we're doing. So let me switch over and give you a quick overview of multi-board design uh, here. So I mentioned this is, this is one of my hobby projects, but I have a more serious reference design that I can show you. Uh, there's three... PCB projects in this one. Mini PC, there's a P, uh, PC4 SODIM, so that's the DDR4 SODIM module. I'll just open the board so you can have a look at what they look like in the PCB editor. 
We're just gonna see the same flight. Oh. I hate the way it does that. I'll just kill PowerPoint. So now you can see it. So in this in this multi-board design I've got a mini PC motherboard. It's actually based on an Altera FPGA system on chip. It's reasonable uh, sort of medium complexity design, so it takes a little while to load all the modules. Once it's loaded, it's pretty quick though. I should have loaded this one before. My apologies. So there it is. Um, zoom in there. So this gives you an idea. There's a big, whoop, big FPGA in the middle. PCIe connector over here. We've got a mini PCIe here. The sodium sockets here. So these are all uh, regular connectors. And if I look in the actual schematics, you'll see this is a sodium socket, for example. This, this, kit, this is just a normal off-the-shelf connector. And if I look at the properties of that connector, we have this is the 3D model for the connector, right? And it's, it's footprint. And then we have this other uh, list of parameters Every part has parameters. Let me drag that down if I can. And there's just a, it recognizes it as a board to board connector. Different types of connectors are, are supported, by the way, for multi board systems. But the, this example uses direct board to board connection. So we have this socket for a sodium. It's got a parameter called system with a value connector, and that's how it knows this is a board to board connector. So then, at a higher level, so we have these PCB designs and their schematics. We have a Wi-Fi module there, mini PCIe. The DRAM module is here. Uh, all of these are complete with their, um, you know, 3D models. And routing's all done and everything. So we can divide and conquer in this case. And then create a multi-board project which brings these into a top-level block diagram. So each of those connectors that's known to be a system connector has um, a, a schematic interface here that allows you to link it to matching or mating connectors on other boards. So here's the Wi-Fi module and we have two instances of the same sodium. And if I look at that, uh, the properties of that, you can choose any other PCB project and any other assembly in that project. And that's important because you may have more than one board in a single project, as I'll show you with my own uh, guitar pedal later. Because um, some people use uh, the actual PCB design and then they have a board for the panel if you're doing panelization. So you can choose which one you're gonna bring into the multi-board project. And then at that, at that point, there's different kinds of connections. You can, you can add different modules. You can uh, do top-down design. You can draw a block diagram first, even before you've done the PCB projects, and say, this is what our system's going to be. And then later on, link in the actual boards that you want to use. And we can do direct wire, cable, and harness connections. In 3D right now, as it is, we're not doing cable and harness modeling. Um, that's that's done best by tools that are specifically designed for that, like SolidWorks Electrical is one example. Um, but we'll, we're working on a basic cable and wiring model uh, for a future version. But for, for today, you can definitely specify what the connections need to be and what the connectors are. And so that means you can still pin swap between them. And that leads me to mention um, that under here we have a connection manager and this is basically 
away, and this one's all clean because it's a, it's a final reference design, but I can look at any connection. Here's the net name on this board, module one, connector J20, pin number three. It's all shown in there. Connects through to DDR4 sodium DQ5 on the child module, which is the actual sodium. So this is showing this signal starts here, goes through these connectors and goes to here. And everything is fully synchronized right now. But if I, um, let me go into, just, just for argument's sake, go into the connector for the Wi-Fi module. And let's say, I'm, I'm just going to emulate a pin swap here by switching these net labels around. Whoops. Right. And I, I saved that. So a pin swap was done on one of the child modules. Well, now, in my multi-board schematic, I can select this one and say, I'm just right-clicking here. I'm going to import from that. And it brings up an ECO uh, or change synchronization. We call it ECO in Altium world brings up the ECO to show that these two pins are getting swapped, these signals are getting swapped. So I'll go ahead and execute that change. Then in the signal manager where I was before, show changes only, and it's going to show if I select both of those, uh, it, should, it should show me this, it shows that these two pins are being swapped on, this is M1 which is the motherboard. <coughs> and this is M4, which is the child board. So I can confirm the pin swap, or I can say, no, we can't do that, revert that, because that's actually going against the JEDEC pinout specification for many PCIe. So we're not going to do that, because that would render the motherboard incompatible with other modules. So you can, you can pull changes into the multi-board system, or push them back down to the child boards and synchronize pin swaps across the entire uh, system through this uh, through this dialog right here. So I'll go ahead and revert that and now they're, sh they're marked as green and if I need to I can generate a report from here or copy this to a clipboard. If you do want to copy and paste this table into a spreadsheet for any reason you can do that if you want. Okay. So then when you're ready and you've, you've brought all your different modules in you can push those into a multi-board PCB document and I've already got that here, that's, that's the one that was showing on the screen when we started. And so this one's already all sort of complete as a reference design but I just want to uh, point out a few specific things here. There's a multi-board assembly panel and you can bring in step models, so for example this is the enclosure base, the enclosure top is, is there but hidden, so let's make it visible. There's the entire enclosure of our product. It's shown green there when I click on it just to show it, it's sort of highlighted. So let me make that invisible again so you can see what's going on here. And uh, when it comes in, normally these boards are all kind of on the same plane shown side by side and there's I don't know what you we call this this thing a gizmo I guess in other other tools it has a different name but you can move them around uh, points and surfaces will snap but probably the most useful thing is mating so we can actually th these are proper 3D models in AD19 of the actual assemblies. There's proper solid models. These are not step renderings of surfaces. They're actual solid models. Um, just like they would be in a mechanical CAD tool. So what we can do with that is create some mates. If I go into mating mode, and then the mating tool uh, can snap to the center of holes, it can go to vertices, it can go to the center of a, a face on a connector. So here I have my mini PCI connector. I can go to the center of that face there as the reference and then center of this face here. Now those those two boards are mated. 
they're married. That's it. If I want to move something around, uh, I can try. Let's go out of mating mode and I'll show you what it looks like. Oh, oops, I didn't want to do that. Let me keep that. I get the gizmo now, but if I move that, oops, I must have undone that mate. I'll show you what it looks like with one of the other model, model uh, modules here. If I click that module and I move its gizmo, it moves everything together because they're mated. So I can't, I can't break that relationship <coughs> once they're aligned. Um, what this also allows you to do is to run very fast clearance checking. Now this, this has got a number of interferences on it. It would take about 40 seconds to a minute to process this on this computer to do a full clearance check. Uh, in the current public version, version 18, it would take a lot longer because um, we did a lot of improvement between versions. So uh, if anyone's interested, maybe I can show you that after. Some other cool stuff. Um, I've shown you the pin swapping and synchronization from the schematic <coughs> side, but you can also trace through signals on, on the multi-board assembly side. So we can highlight any individual component. If you need to find it, you can click on it. Um, you can look at different layer copper and silk screen items. But let's say I want to look at a differential pair or the net class for byte line zero from the FPGA to the sodium sockets. So that's highlighting that. I can see where the signal's going and what socket pins it's going to. And then on one of the sodium modules, I could highlight the same matching net and make sure that they, they line up. So let's find byte line zero there on that one. Byte line zero on the other side of the series terminators is there. So I can highlight those. And then let me go back to this one. And I'm just holding down control to multi-select. Oops, wrong one there. It's this one. So you can see, even visually, you can trace the signals through all of the boards and the connectors and see that, yes, um, at least as a quick eyeball test, these, these line up correctly. And uh, this has actually saved me on another design, another reference design I did for a, a touch wall dimmer that had two boards and just very simple through-hole connectors, uh, just 0.1 inch pitch headers and socket, and I had them mirrored. So this is was one of the other slides in my deck that I didn't go to, but one of the most common problems with a multi-board assembly when you're prototyping is the pin numbering of connectors. Has anyone run into this? I've had this problem. You get even just a simple, humble pin header and a pin header socket. The manufacturer data sheet shows pin one where? At the top left. And when you put one of them on the bottom side of a board to connect to another board, it's mirrored. Now you have a problem. This will, this will help you see that problem because you can trace the signal through and you know, hang on a second, it's going to pin one up here, but pin one ain't pin one down there. So you can make sure you actually reassign the pin nets correctly so that you don't have that mirroring problem with connectors. Does it make sense? Is, is this still a manual visual verification or if, if you, for instance, use same name, that names on both boards, can it check for you? Yeah, it will actually, if the net names match and the pin numbers don't, it's going to tell you there's a problem. So it can actually uh, either highlight a problem in your footprint in the library or highlight a problem in the design that you're going to at least have to check that this is connected um, correctly. Yep. I don't know how much time I've got, Bob. It's like I'm supposed to finish officially now, but there's so much, I guess, so much more. Um, just using up some of your QA. Okay. Um, just really quickly, then, I'll show you my own my own little project here, which is a very, very simple design. It's all analog. You can see here, uh, does anyone recognize what this might be? 
the telltale is these back-to-back -back diets. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> this is a this is an an overdrive. So this this is a clipping circuit that limits the voltage of the signal and causes distortion. Okay. So and the way I've modeled this one, I've got everything on one board except I've got a connector here and I have another PCB design which is the foot switch and an LED. So here's the foot switch and LED. It's all through hole, very very basic stuff, but Sounds good to me. <laughs> There's my foot switch and LED. The LED model's missing legs, but I'm sure you can overlook that. Um, but I've got two PCB designs in the actual PCB mainboard project. So here's my user controls. If we look at that, you can see that uh, the foot switch plugs into that header there, right? Go back to 2D mode, and then, as I mentioned earlier, I actually, for the front panel, used use the PCB editor to align everything, just because it was the way I know to do it. It's pretty easy. But I use this to also, if we look at that in 3D, this is what it looks like on the final thing. So it's that's my front panel design. And all of this I want to bring together to make sure everything's aligned and is going to fit. So I create a multi-board assembly, Here's my main board. There's the connection between the main board and the foot switch, and the label's just the standalone PCB. It doesn't have to connect to be in a multi-board design. You can bring any number of boards into this if you want, and they may be electrically separated. That's okay. So then, let me just um, flip over into the multi-board assembly. And this is what they all look like once they're brought in. So again, just to show you the mating capability, I'll start here. And I'm gonna to go to the middle of that pin on the pin header. And that's gonna go into the middle of the bottom of that socket. And so it comes in, and that's mated based on that. Doesn't quite look right. So now I have to rotate, and now it's correct. So I can lock it. Done. What about the height? How do you set the height there? Um, well, this automatically set the height for the tip of the end of the pin for the end of the socket. Yeah, but it doesn't look right, does it? Um, it's probably... Yeah, in this case, it might it might be. So I can I can delete that mate and start again. You can remove mates. Um, it's it remains in position, so you can actually use the mating to get it in position and align it, and then I can adjust the height if I want. Um, and of course, you know. You don't have to use mates. You can you can just use the gizmo and sort of. I know that these align because I I used guides in the actual PCB design. I planned before I designed it where things were going to be. So um, so there's there's different ways you can do it. Um, this one's not showing the enclosure because I didn't I didn't have the step model for the enclosure on this computer. So IT just gave me this computer a couple of weeks ago. I haven't moved everything over yet, but um, there's probably a lot more. Uh, there's you can go into section mode, so you can. So you since can, the LED is way up and the leads are long, it doesn't show them, or no, that's just a bad model. I didn't use a proper step oh. model from the manufacturer. I I made that model in the library using a sphere and two cylinders and two other cylinders and I just moved it out of expedience. I didn't lengthen the leads. But um, because it's a proper solid model you can you can do cross sections in any any sort of direction and make sure things aren't interfering. So where do the models come from? Like, um, do, you have, do you have to design all your models? Or? No. Um, the number of manufacturers will give you step models, but they won't give you solid models. 
that's a good question. These ones are, are actually were all step models, but the multi-board rendering engine has um, turned them into solid models. <laughs> so it's, mm. it's assuming they're just full of the same material. But if you have a step model from a manufacturer, like I've downloaded some, like these, these Neutrik jacks, for example, that's a step model, but it came from a proper solid model. Um, there were others, maybe not these ones, there were others I had similar to this where the actual sheet metal parts inside were still there in the step model. So the step model files were really big, but they had that detail and, it, and you can do a cross section and see all that stuff in it. If, if your models are that good. Right. Mostly, they're, they're not usually, but... So these, these models, most of them came from... I got these ones all pretty much from 3D Content Central. So they're yeah. community contributed. Um, they're not from the Altium library. They're just ones I used in my design. For the, for the other reference design I was showing, they mainly came from the Altium content library, so they were developed by us, by our team. You have separate models for each values on the resistors? For the right uh, in this case, no. I used, <laughs> they're all, they, you can tell they're all 1K. <laughs> uh, it's funny, we used to have the legacy 3D viewer in Altium Designer from the, from Proto 99 SE could, would actually, if they were through hole resistors, it would actually color them according to the, the normal coding. I'd like them to bring that back, but they say, well, no one uses through hole parts anymore, so what does it even matter? <laughs> yeah. Big well, it can, this can this help with yeah. assembly drawings. Like, you can even take screenshots from this and give them to the contract manufacturer, and they'll go, now I get how you want this put together. I mean, yeah. So Anything that ends confusion is good. Yeah. <laughs> even if it's just a screenshot. Right? <coughs> so, so... I mean, I want to turn it over to you guys for more questions, but um, just a little bit of trivia that I like to ask. I like to ask, if I have a 10-pin, 0.1-inch pitch header, how fast of a signal can you put through that? What do you reckon? How fast can you make a point, cheap 0.1-inch pitch header go? Is there any other conditions? Does it have to go through? Can it, does it have to attenuate less than this and that? Um, practically, yes, but, but just conceptually. If it's 0, 0, 25, so the 0, 25 square pins? Yeah. Okay. So a couple gig? Yeah. You can actually go pretty darn fast. So you don't always need the most expensive connectors for your multi-board assembly. And the example I, I like to use is IEEE 1394 and USB 2.0. Both of them support 480 megabits per second. And how you do it? Differential pairs and grounding for each signal. Grounding for a ground return path for each signal. Um, there's a whole other section on my presentation about multi-board SI which I didn't get into uh, but I'm happy to share the slide deck with anyone who's interested but something that people often overlook until you have a problem is that if you I'll just quickly do this you have m more than one board here and you have maybe a power supply and you're feeding power and ground to these and then you have a device here, device here, and some kind of connection between them, and some high-speed signals. If you're not careful with adding enough return grounds, you're going to be forcing some of that into here and all the way around here, and you're going to have EMI problems and sig bad signal integrity problems that mean, worst case, it just won't even work. <coughs> Less worst case, it kind of works, but you won't pass EMI testing. And so it's just another whole subject to con consider. But um, yeah, Any, anything else? This portion not sponsored by Samtech. <laughs> 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 well, no. 
good. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful.